Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steven Hernandez, and I'm the Executive Director of the Legislature's Nonpartisan Commission on Women, Children, Seniors, Equity, and Opportunity. We're here today to conduct a virtual town hall meeting on the power of C, el poder del C, Hispanic leadership, community service, and civic engagement during a pandemic, uh, and beyond, really. Uh, just by way of background, today begins Hispanic Heritage Month in the United States. Hispanic Heritage Month is a period from September 15th to the 15th of October, which recognizes the contributions and influence of Hispanic Americans to our history, culture, and achievements in the United States and in Connecticut. This year's theme, Hispanic Americans, a history of serving our nation, invites us to reflect, reflect on Hispanic American service and contributions to the history of, of this nation and to Connecticut. The week was first proclaimed by President Lyndon B. Johnson in 1968 via presidential proclamation. President Nixon's Ford, Carter, and Reagan gave annual proclamations for Hispanic Heritage Week between 69 and 1988. National Hispanic Heritage Month was first proclaimed by President George H.W. Bush on September 14th, and ever since, all U.S. presidents have given a presidential proclamation to mark Hispanic Heritage Month. September 15th was chosen as a starting point for the commemoration because of its anniversary of independence of five Hispanic countries, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua, several countries which are represented by peoples here in the state of Connecticut. On that year, in 1821, they declared their independence from the empire of Spain. In addition, Mexico, Chile, and Belize celebrate their independence days on September 16th, 18th, and September 21st, respectively. There is a center of gravity uh, all throughout Latino America that really brings us all together as Latinos. And I'm especially proud to be here today with Latinos who have had an influence in the state of Connecticut. Many of you are mentors of mine. I am a fan of all of you, and I'm really excited to be uh, in this conversation with you today. Uh, firstly, just for a little bit of background and to give us some of the flavor for the demographics of of, of both uh, Latinos, but especially Puerto Ricans in Connecticut. Uh, I now turn to Professor Charles Venegar San, uh, Venetor Santiago. Uh, professor Venetor Santiago is an associate professor with a joint appointment in the Department of Political Science and El Instituto, which is the Institute for Latino, Latina, Caribbean, and Latin American Studies. Professor Santiago, you are no uh, stranger to this commission and to this state, so I'm especially pleased to welcome you today. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I, I, I was asked to prepare a short presentation that has grown exponentially, but I'll try to breeze through this as quickly as I can uh, to provide a little bit of data or, or what we know so far uh, as a way to contextualize some conversations. So I'm going to share my screen and do my second PowerPoint presentation ever in my life on live TV. Uh, so please forgive me. Um, oops. Let me, one second. Okay, uh, so I, I, I was asked uh, to prepare a little bit of, of information or, or pull out what the available data on Latinos in the state of Connecticut. Uh, but let me begin by saying that we've seen over the past 10 years or, or close to be 10 years, an exponential growth of Latinos in the United States or Hispanics in the United States. And when I say, I mean, we're, we're looking at two points uh, pretty much, or I'm sorry, four points pretty much. That's a large number of Latinos that are growing. Um, some of the challenges that I have for this presentation, I wanna highlight because I think they're helpful to anybody who's interested in this information. The new census data is on, the, on 2019 or Latinos in, in the United States in 2019 uh, is going to be scheduled for release in two days. Uh, so in some ways, the commission is ahead of the game uh, there. And I wish I had that information, but I don't think it's gonna be that much different than what I'm going to share today, but we'll see. Uh, what are the fundamental problems that we're having is that between 2017 and 2020, we've had an immense, uh, a, 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 a large mobility of Puerto Ricans, not only in the state of Connecticut, but also through the, around the United States in large measure due to natural disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, and economic crisis, and uh, more recently, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, a new census report recently released uh, report suggests that 
in 2018 and 2019, or rather 2019, we saw a large number of Puerto Ricans who were coming to the United States, who were in Connecticut, returning to Puerto Rico. And that's really interesting. And I think people, uh, and we'll return to that conversation in a second, but I think people should pay attention to, again, how law, a lot of Puerto Ricans are returning back to the island after leaving as a result of the economic crisis in the island and the hurricane and other natural disasters. Um, in addition to that, what we're also seeing is that there have been some problems in the uh, request for funding and the implementation of funding under the CARES Act in Puerto Rico. Uh, so a lot of Puerto Ricans are not receiving all the potential benefits from the or relief that they could from the CARES Act in the island, and they're coming to the United States to seek some of those benefits. Uh, and finally, part of the challenge here is that the austerity approach that the Fiscal Oversight and Management Board imposed in Puerto Rico has actually uh, disabled the, the economy in significant ways, elim eliminating jobs, which have been exacerbated by the natural disasters, the pandemic, and so on and so forth, forcing a lot of people to leave the island. So we have a lot of push-pull factors that are fairly intense for a short amount of time, uh, or at least for, uh, during the last couple of years. Um, I, I, this map, the current map is being developed by the Center for Puerto Rican Studies right now as we speak. Uh, I have some data that is going to be released shortly, but uh, this is an earlier version of the, a Connecticut report developed by the Center for Puerto Rican Studies analyzing sort of population and voting uh, trends in the state of Connecticut. As you will notice, again, most of the population is sort of centered on the corridor towards Boston, from New York towards Boston. And this has historically been uh, the case uh, because there's a lot of mobility in and out uh, from Massachusetts to New York and Connecticut. It seems to be like a layover state. Um, one of the things that I want to highlight in, in this presentation is that we do know that between 2017 and 2018, and I think these, this trend continues, there has been a decrease of, Puerto Rico, of the Puerto Rican population in New Haven or the so-called New Haven County, uh, as well as in Tolan. And these are, these are significant differences. And there's been a, an exponential growth in uh, Fairfield County, Litchfield County, and Middlesex County. They're not the largest counties, but we're seeing a lot more mobility of Puerto Ricans to those counties. In addition to that, I, I, and I can make this available to other folks, I did try to make pie charts and make it look really nice, but my Excel sheet was confusing the uh, percentages and was giving me lower percentages. So I decided to go with a table. Um, but what we do know is that the two largest county, quote unquote, counties for two, uh, containing most Puerto Ricans in the state are Hartford County and New Haven County. Uh, and then from there, we're seeing a growth in places like Wyndham County and uh, places like uh, Fairfield County. Again, consistent with what we've seen in the past couple of years. Well, as a, as a note, I want to say that currently, or the 2018 data suggests that Connecticut has 16.5% uh, of the population, or 16.5% of the population identifies as Hispanic, and a little bit more than half, close to 54% or 52%, identify as Puerto Rican, the rest being non-Hispanics, uh, non or non-Puerto Rican Hispanics, or Puerto Rican, uh, Hispanics of not, not of Puerto Rican heritage. Now, it, this is really important because the electoral, as I'll mention, this has an impact on the electoral participation of Latinos in the state. And I'll say something about that in a little bit. Uh, what we do know is that between 2010 and 2016, growth of Latinos or Hispanics in the state of Connecticut uh, increased by 17%. And there is no doubt that that's going to continue to be an upward trend for lots of reasons and some of which I'll, I'll explain in a minute. Uh, there was a temporary spike between 2017 and 2018 as a result of Hurricane Maria, or the displacement of Puerto Ricans coming to Connecticut. But as we now know, a lot of Puerto Ricans returned to the island, a significant amount of Puerto Ricans, not only in Connecticut, but across the United States. I have, there are, I'm working on a couple of research projects, so I'm going to share information vaguely because I'm not authorized to, to, to share too much information right now. So everything that I'm sharing with you about sort of on the ground conditions, is, it's part of a series of studies that I'm working on. I just have to maintain a degree of confidentiality. Uh, and some of it will be released uh, shortly or later. Uh, but Puerto Ricans, one of the challenges that we're seeing is that Puerto Ricans are expected to move a lot in a large measure due to the economic crisis in both Puerto Rico and the U.S. Uh, 
And this includes a substantive uh, movement of Puerto Ricans who come to Connecticut looking for opportunities, arrive, don't find a vibrant labor market or enough jobs, especially in the pandemic, and are now returning to Puerto Rico for one simple reason. It, living in poverty in Puerto Rico can be easier than living in poverty in the United States because you have a lot more networks, social supports. Uh, and this is a real uh, challenge, both in Hartford and uh, in Connecticut in general, in Hartford specifically, in Puerto Rico, where you have multi-generational uh, family consolidation. What we're seeing is two, three generations, maybe four generations of families living in a two-bedroom apartment in Hartford, as well as in Puerto Rico and other states of the union. And I, I have some of my research uh, here in Hartford. Uh, it's clear that a lot of families are consolidating not only uh, because of their budgets, but because of safety concerns. They're moving together. And this is something that we should, uh, as hard as it is, we should recognize it's a great thing. There's a great degree of solidarity that surprises me in some ways because people are, 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 under, are suffering in some ways or are living in harsh conditions as a result of the economic crisis and the pandemic crisis. Uh, I don't have the recent labor data on Puerto Ricans, so I can't say much about that, but it is available, it is my understanding. It's just under these conditions, it's hard to gain access to data. But uh, there is data available in the Connecticut Department of Labor on Latinos and the labor market, which should be great to look at, especially given the, the sort of transitional nature of this pandemic. Um, we still see the typical push and pull factors. There are push factors in, the, in Puerto Rico as a result of the economy, as a result of the disasters that are having, as a result of government uh, mismanagement of resources. And there's a pull factor in Connecticut still because uh, despite the crisis that is affecting Connecticut, Puerto Ricans can still gain more or access to social services here in Connecticut that they cannot receive or get in or receive in Puerto Rico for lots of reasons. And even though uh, Puerto Ricans in New England are thought to be sort of the, the ones that are living in most poverty around the nation. Um, let me say something on elections. Uh, historically, in, in most of the research available suggests that Latinos tend to vote or Latinx populations tend to vote Democrat. And most of the recent research suggests that they're really enthusiastic about participating in the 2020 presidential elections. Uh, that's not just in Connecticut, but across the nation. There is something going on. Uh, and again, when I say most Latinos or, and Puerto Ricans, we're talking on the average of anywhere from 60 to 70 percent identify as Democrats. Uh, such about 20 percent identify as, uh, as Republican. And depending on the place, anywhere from 10 to 30 percent may identify as independents. Uh, in terms of voter registration and elections, Based on my experience over the past 12 years in Connecticut, I think we have to focus on local center support centers as a way to register individuals. Um, I had an opportunity to work with Mr. Yanadel years ago in the uh, Suboto Cuenta, when it used to be the Latino and Puerto Rican Affairs Commission. And the great success of that initiative was approaching individuals in uh, uh, community centers and churches and places where Latinos tend to congregate, supermarkets, and there was a high degree of voter registration. If I recall correctly, the goal was to, receive, uh, was to achieve 10,000 registrants and the initiative uh, registered over 20,000 uh, potential voters. So I think we need to focus on some of that if we wanna motivate some people to, or register people to vote and motivate them to participate in the 2020 elections. What we do know from the Pew Hispanic Center is that in Connecticut, uh, uh, Latinos uh, account for 16.5 uh, of the population, but account uh, eligible voters account for 12.3% uh, of the population. Uh, I'm sorry, 12.3%. Uh, and Puerto Rican voters account for 54.5% of the population, of the eligible voter population in uh, the state of Connecticut. Now, again, this is a significant uh, amount of, uh, of voters who could influence uh, elections in one direction or another, uh, especially given this larger number. Um, in terms of the pandemic, and again, the, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies is working on a comprehensive analysis. I, I'm gonna share some information uh, that I've had the, the privilege of discussing with some colleagues over there. But what we do see is the usual. There's lack of available housing, lack of employment, food insecurity. Those are the three problems that have been persistent for a while. 
Um, in terms of the experiences, they are experiencing uh, some of the same challenges that most uh, residents of Connecticut are experiencing. And those include lack of employment, again, more they need mortgage assistance or rent assistance primarily uh, for a lot of uh, Puerto Ricans in particular, uh, access to adequate housing and the usual traditional uh, needs that we see that er that people living in poverty are experiencing here in or at the verge of poverty are experiencing. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, there's an increase uh, in multi-generational living. Uh, grandmothers and children and grandchildren are coming together. The grandparents may serve, uh, may, may play a role of child care uh, provider or assist in uh, distance learning uh, curriculums. They may monitor students while they're in distance learning, while their children or other individuals are engaged in the labor market or trying to find work. Uh, this helps to consolidate budgets and they support each other in all kinds of uh, really admirable ways. Um, I, I, I want to emphasize this point a lot because Hispanic Heritage Month, I think, should celebrate the, the collective sense of solidarity that we see among Hispanics in the state of Connecticut, and I would argue in larger places, but I'm focusing on Connecticut, um, especially by people who are short on resources. I am seeing a lot of support among people, working class families, who are finding ways to support each other uh, financially and in other ways. And they're cramming together and in, in sometimes inadequate housing uh, in an effort to provide support and solidarity to each other. What we are seeing also is an increase in mobility, which makes it really hard to look at data. A lot of Puerto Ricans are moving all over the place, and not only within Connecticut, but they're using Connecticut as a staging point to go throughout the nation. For example, uh, individuals who have uh, higher degrees and come to Connecticut have a tendency to jump over to states like North Carolina, Texas, Georgia, where there are more high-tech jobs. Some individuals are coming to Connecticut and then going to Florida when they can't find jobs in Connecticut. But we do, we do know there's a lot of mobility here. Uh, and finally, I, I wanna emphasize, uh, there's a recent NPR survey report on the impact of COVID uh, on, on the populations the, in large cities. And Latinos in the in five top cities are, soft, are are impacted the worst. I mean, we're talking over upwards of 70%, 73% in the case of New York City, who are impacted negatively uh, financially as a result of this uh, pandemic. I don't know what the numbers are in Hartford, but my anecdotal experience suggests that Latinos may be, and Puerto Ricans in particular, may be disproportionately impacted here in the city of Hartford. Uh, and we're talking about 70%. <laughs> Compared to the to the experiences of Black and White uh, Americans, this is a significant departure. So I would encourage some focus on the on, on that disproportionate impact on Puerto Ricans and Latinos in the state of Connecticut. Uh, and then finally, I, I've included a couple quick reports that uh, I'll make available to anybody who's interested, which uh, I think give you a sense of, of some of the ways to think about demo demographic shifts and uh, the data collection and the impact of the crisis on Puerto Ricans in Connecticut uh, and more broadly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Renter Santiago. You know, you your presentation really does reveal a couple of things that always sit presently on the minds of those of us who work with community. And that is the incredible, uh, not only longevity and contribution of the Puerto Rican community to the state of Connecticut, but also the promise of continuing contribution and expanded influence in the state of Connecticut. You did mention the fact that, um, uh, that there is a political threshold of influence that, that is being experienced, but also uh, you know, the changing demographics in terms of where Puerto Ricans live in the state of Connecticut and how that influence may change over time, develop and grow. So there's a lot, of, uh, there's a lot to talk about here. There's a lot to unpack. Uh, and firstly, I would love to turn uh, to our Secretary of the State, our very own Denise Merrill. Uh, Denise was elected to her third term as Connecticut's 73rd Secretary of the State in November of 2018. As Connecticut's Chief Elections Official and Business Registrar, uh, Secretary Merrill has focused on modernizing Connecticut's elections, business services, and improving access to public records. Secretary Merrill is focused on both civic engagement and fostering business enterprise. Since taking office, she has supported and expanded democratic participation, ensuring that every citizen's rights and privileges 
are protected and that every vote is counted accurately. Uh, Secretary Merrill, welcome. I'm so happy to have you here. You know, a lot of this is about civics and about being able to participate and you're at the core of that, so welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, uh, I've been working on this a long time and I've worked extensively with the Puerto Rican and Hispanic community in Connecticut. And so, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts and I wanna uh, thank the professor for his work on this. Uh, first thing that I always think about is how difficult it is to get data about uh, the Puerto Rican population or the broader Hispanic population, especially with regard to elections. Uh, because we don't ask questions about heritage uh, when we sign people up to vote. So uh, I've been looking at this for a number of years, and I think there are some really interesting things going on this year in particular, largely re related to the way we're allowing people to vote in this year of COVID. Uh, so I have definitely seen the expansion of the both the influence and just the size of the population over the last 10 years in particular, and have tried very hard to be a source of inspiration, shall we say, for civic participation among this and many other communities. But um, what always strikes me is uh, that the Puerto Rican population is very political. Uh, they are very interested in politics. They follow it avidly. Um, they have a a different political culture, which does come into play because in Puerto Rico, as many of you probably know, uh, there's almost 100% participation in elections, which would be the envy of the United States where we, our participation rates are really quite dismal uh, compared to most other developed countries. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And people are constantly bemoaning the fact that there are so many, we think up to a third of the eligible voters in the United States are not even registered to vote. Uh, now, recently, I think with all the clamor over um, the elections in the last couple of cycles, that could be changing uh, for a variety of reasons, mostly because people are so worked up about so many things. And, and they are begin I am beginning to see new life from the new generation. Uh, I think the most exciting thing I've seen at least in Connecticut, and I think in other states, is that there are new young people registering to vote for the first time in many, many years in large numbers. Uh, we saw a tremendous increase in uh, voters between the ages of 18 and 24. And I believe that the uh, Hispanic population is no exception to that, that this newer generation, uh, they're taking that political interest and fortunately, they are, I think, going to express it, particularly in this coming election uh, and through through voting. And that now, as we all know, I'm, I'm from the 70s personally, and I know it doesn't always work that way. People choose different ways to express their activism, not always uh, through the electoral process. I think this is going to be very positive from that point of view, this election. Uh, but also, I do think that there is a bit of a culture clash, I think, on, a, on the subject of elections and just civic participation generally in the Hispanic community. And I just know that because for many years I've been appearing on uh, Hispanic radio stations and television stations uh, and in the media, uh, going to civic groups, uh, getting people activated. And they are somewhat puzzled, I think sometimes by American um, electoral process. It's pretty complicated. Uh, and it's become more so this year because now we're instituting this brand new, you know, everybody can vote by absentee ballot. Now, it took me a long time to explain to this population from Puerto Rico exactly how you got your ballot, you know, where you went to the polling places. It's much more restrictive than it is in Puerto Rico. And people are just amazed by that. Uh, you know, in Puerto Rico, election day is a big celebration. First of all, it's a day off. Uh, and everyone uh, goes, marches in parades, and it's a big party, and they have election cake. Uh, here, not so much. Uh, many of my Puerto Rican friends have complained that you barely know when election day is, and that there's so many different elections. There's you know, there's local elections and state elections, and now we have the presidential election. 
And I think it's very confusing to people. And that is not helpful when it comes to trying to activate this population to express their very political views. Uh, so that I think is a big challenge, especially this year. And I have spent a great deal of my time trying to explain to people the very complicated process by which you can get an absentee ballot this year. Um, and despite all the efforts, I get literally hundreds of phone calls through my office every day from a lot of Puerto Rican people who are totally confused about this whole issue of, well, you have to get an application, and then you have to mail the application into the, into the town hall, then the town clerk will send you a ballot back, but not for weeks. So people would wait and wait, they'd send their application in, and then in the primary, they didn't get their ballot for a month. So they panicked. They didn't know what was going on, you know. So all these things are going on in the larger population, but especially, I think, in a population that's not used to all this complexity when you go to vote. For them, it's like, let's just go vote. <laughs> so you add to that the fact that there has been so much, um, so much voter suppression, honestly, in the last 10 years, uh, particularly arising out of a concern uh, largely in a, in a lot of Southern states in particular, uh, not so much here in Connecticut because we haven't let it happen, but this whole movement to increase the number of you know voter IDs that you need with this big concern that there are going to be all these illegal aliens voting. Um, and that, that of course is not such an issue here in Connecticut because Puerto Ricans are citizens. So there's already one big barrier that is not there for Puerto Ricans that is there for a great many of the people in places like Texas and Arizona and uh, New Mexico and California. And so um, I think that has confused the picture for a lot of people also. So we're, fa you know, we're facing a number of challenges trying to activate this amazingly political group of people. Boy, do they have opinions. And I, I go on these uh, radio shows with a guy like Felix uh, over there in New Britain, and uh, people call in with questions. They've got lots of uh, opinions about how the process works, about elections in general, and certainly about candidates. So that's so encouraging to me. I think everything we're doing, mostly what I'm impressed by is the fact that we need to be reaching out to community groups. This population is very connected into their communities, very locally, not so much at the statewide level. Many of them still watch Puerto Rican television, for example. So they're getting a lot of their information about candidates, about candidates in Puerto Rico. Uh, and also, of course, nationally. So they'll get news about the national elections, but very little about anything in between that, like the statewide, the state representatives, the state uh, senators, even local council races, not so much. So there's there are, I think, a couple of challenges here for us to reach this population and make sure that they are exercising that opportunity that they want very much, uh, but we need to help them figure it out and we need to find ways to uh, get to them that, that works for Connecticut. Uh, so I've dedicated a lot of my time to this sort of thing. I've thought about it a lot. And um, I think we're gonna do a pretty good job with it this, this year because we have had so many years to practice uh, and so many community groups that are now very activated uh, in all the larger communities in Connecticut. I was interested in the graph about the new spread uh, of where people are going mobility wise. Uh, because you're right, the corridor, we're pretty good in the corridor. The outlying areas, not so much. I don't have as many contacts in those areas. So I think I'll stop there um, and throw it out for a challenge to others to see if we can sort of solve some of these uh, conundrums about how we get people civically engaged, because I think they very much want to be. Thank you, Secretary Merrill. And, and, and thank you for all the work that you've done in really trying to clarify the process and make the process of being civically engaged more accessible uh, to, to people, especially to Latinos. You know, as I, as I think about a saying in, in our language, in the Spanish language, it says, when we greet a new guest into our home, we say, estás en tu casa, which means you are in your home. And that's really, a, that's a powerful statement. And I think that for so many of us, 
who are new to Connecticut or who are a couple of generations in, that 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 really that invitation of you are in your home hasn't been heard as clearly. And, and those recent efforts to ensure that not only have we found a way to come into the home, but also have a seat at the table is really uh, part of your efforts and, and part of, I think, the challenge for the state of Connecticut in ensuring that there is more civic engagement by Latinos and Puerto Ricans in the state. So thank you for all that you do. And, you know, part of, part of that uh, political feeling of home and that feeling of, the, of we are part of the civic infrastructure of the state is for the story of our influence and the story of our experience to be told uh, here where we are. And one of, our, one of our champions of the story being told here with us today is Danny Vargas. Danny Vargas is an award-winning noted businessman and community leader. He's an accomplished media commentator and marketing public relations professional. Danny is a proud US Air Force intelligence veteran serving seven years on active duty. Uh, Mr. Vargas is currently chairman of the Friends of the National Museum of the American Latino, and he has been working for many years now for the creation of the National Museum of the American Latino uh, in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. For all of that, we thank you and we welcome you. Estás en tu casa. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it. I lo allow me to say happy Hispanic Heritage Month to everyone. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all uh, on this very special day. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll take a brief moment of uh, personal privilege to say that I, I am from a neighboring state. I grew up in, in New York City, uh, an area called Brooklyn. You may have heard of it. Uh, but I also want to say thank you very much to Connecticut. Uh, there is one special uh, friend who's been part of the museum effort for a long time, as long as I have, uh, Rosa Correa, who's just a, a dear friend and such a wonderful leader. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Ollanadel as well for having supported our efforts over the years. I'm going to take a step back and give you a little bit of history of uh, both where we are with the museum initiative, as well as the contributions that Latinos have made to the founding, the building, the shaping, and the defending of this country. Um, I'll start by saying that it's, um, I've been living in the Washington, D.C. area for almost 30 years now, and people think of Washington, D.C. as a city of politics and power plays and monuments and museums, and that's correct but it's also a city of many more museums than you would think. There are something like 70 museums in the DC area, uh, but the cream of the crop have always been the 17 national museums within the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, included among them are a couple of the newer ones, the National Museum of the American Indian and the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Unfortunately, what you will not see is a National American Latino Museum. And that's a shame because there really ought to be one. And when we talk to people about our initiative, they're surprised when we tell them that, does, that one does not exist. Because the reality is that for over 500 years, Latinos have been contributing to this country. Um, in fact, we're told in elementary school that the American story begins when the British gets to Jamestown, Virginia in 1607 to establish the first permanent British settlement. Well, as, I, as far as I'm concerned, that's historically inaccurate. From my perspective, it begins 114 years before that on uh, Columbus's second voyage to the New World in 1493 when he arrives on the shores of what is now U.S. territory in Puerto Rico. So American expansion really doesn't go from Virginia to the north and to the south. American expansion really goes from the Caribbean up to Florida, onto Alabama and Mississippi, Texas and California, as far north as Wyoming. In fact, by the time the British gets to Jamestown in 1607, there's already been a bunch of Latinos saying, bienvenidos, what took you so long? So it's time for us to be able to correct that misperception. Um, imagine, for example, we've all seen those movies where you go back in time and you change something in the past and it alters the present. So imagine, for example, the United States of America without roughly the lower half of the country and most of the West. Well, we don't have to because Latinos have been founding and settling communities throughout most of the U.S. territory, including the first city in the United States, the first permanent European settlement that was St. Augustine, Florida, and the first capital of a state, that's Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, imagine also if General Washington had not won the War of Independence. Well, we don't have to because Spanish General Bernardo de Galvez and over 11,000 Spanish troops were then helped to stem the advance of the British from the South. Imagine if the first Admiral of the United States Navy during the Civil War had not uttered those immortal words, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. Well, you don't have to because the first admiral in the United States Navy was David Farragut, or more accurately pronounced David Farragut, whose biological father was a Spanish soldier who fought on behalf of the rebels in the Revolutionary War. Imagine 
if we didn't have the half million Latino troops fighting in every theater of World War II, making a significant difference. Imagine the Korean conflict. If we didn't have the exploits of the U.S. Army's 65th Infantry Regiment, the Borincanillas of Puerto Rico, setting the gold standard for the bravery of our combat unit. Imagine if you went to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., and not see the thousands of Hispanic surnames etched on that wall. Or imagine if you didn't have the young Latinas and Latinos fighting and sacrificing on our behalf in the battlefields of Afghanistan and Iraq, or the 61 Hispanic Medal of Honor recipients. My friends, as an Air Force veteran myself, I'm here to tell you that Latinos take a backseat to no one in the defense of liberty. Imagine if we didn't have a strong cadre of Latino players on virtually every baseball team in America, America's pastime, an era that was held to be ushered in by one of my personal heroes, number 21, Roberto Clemente, who faced discrimination not only because he was Latino, but also because he was Black. Imagine if we had a television sitcom where you only had one camera, maybe two. Well, we don't have to because innovator Desi Arnaz came up with the idea of a live studio audience and a three camera shot. Imagine, speaking of television, if we didn't have that amazing woman who changed the face of television in the 1970s, uh, Linda Jean Cordova Carter, also known as Linda Carter, television's Wonder Woman. Imagine if we didn't have school desegregation. Well, we don't have to worry about that because in the 1940s, Felicitas Mendez, a Puerto Rican woman who moved to California and married a Mex uh, Mexican immigrant, uh, sued the government of California in the famous Mendez v. v. Uh, Westminster case to end school segregation, which led then to Brown versus Board of Education, the landmark uh, civil rights case in the Supreme Court. Imagine today the absence of Latino workers in our farms and in our factories, in our hotels and in our hospitals, in our restaurants and in our research laboratories, in our sanitation departments and in our Supreme Court of the United States, in our music studios and in our movie sets where we don't have to because for 500 years, we've been relying on Latinos to fight our wars and to run our businesses to tend our fields and to mend our wounds, to patrol our streets, write our laws, and to share the word of God. My friends, contrary to what some might have you believe, Latinos are not a recent patch being sewn onto the tapestry of America. We're an essential foundational thread woven into the very fabric of America. And it's for these reasons that we need a national American Latino Museum on the National Mall as part of the Smithsonian Institution. And that's what we've been working towards for a long time. The effort began 26 years ago when a task force put together by the Smithsonian itself to see how they were doing in terms of portraying Latino stories uh, came back with a report in 1994. The title they chose for that report was Willful Neglect, saying not only was the Smithsonian doing a poor job, it's as if they were doing it on purpose. So fast forward several years later, a bill was passed in Congress in 2008 to create a commission to study the feasibility of creating a National American Latino Museum, and I was appointed to that commission. It was one of the 10 recommendations of the Wolf and Neglect Report was to create an American Latino Museum. Well, we came together and we traveled all over the country getting testimony from, from Americans uh, of all stripes, and we delivered our report to Congress and the President in May of 2011. The title we chose for our report was to illuminate the American story for the benefit of all for all of us, all Americans, and all people visiting this country get, to get a better sense of who we are as a nation. Because this is truly about illuminating American story, a more complete and accurate telling of American history, to fill the missing chapters and the missing pages in our history books, and to tell the missing stories from our museums. But it's not only about looking at the past, it's also about uh, creating a better understanding of who our community is today. We are, we know the numbers, we're 18% of the population, we are 60 million people. Um, we are $2 trillion in purchasing power. Uh, we're not a race, we're a culture. We are Afro-Latinos, we are Asian Latinos. We're blonde haired and blue eyed. We are mulatos and mestizos. You know, I did Ancestry DNA recently. I found out that I'm a genetic Sancocho. I'm 50% Iberian, I'm Native American, I'm African, I'm Western European, but that's us. We're not a race. We're a culture made up of some very foundational, fundamental shared values around family and faith and freedom and optimism 
and passion and pride, and those are the qualities most in need in our country today. And then finally, uh, it's also about inspiring future generations. We know that the Census Bureau tells us that by the year 2060s, Latvia will make up 30% uh, of the US population. So if we hope to remain a strong, thriving, and vibrant nation, that segment of the population needs to feel acknowledged, engaged, and invested in our future. So we've been at this for several years, trying to get this bill passed in Congress to authorize the Smithsonian to move forward with this museum. This year, after several years of introducing the bill, we finally were able to get the bill passed in the House of Representatives on the 27th of July. It passed unanimously on a voice vote because we were able to garner uh, 295 bipartisan co-sponsors from across the ideological spectrum. And the bill then went over to the Senate where we now have 44 co-sponsors. Uh, and we are in the effort of trying to gather even more co-sponsors so that we can get it uh, passed in the Senate and then signed by the president. Everyone can help by going to AmericanLatinoMuseum.org, finding out how to contact your senator or other senators and encouraging them to support this bill. Um, because for me personally, I've been involved in this effort for 12 years now. Uh, and I would love to be able to walk in with my children and my future grandchildren. But more importantly, I have a vision of a young Latina born today in Connecticut. And on her sixth grade field trip, she can travel down to Washington, D.C. And she can marvel at the monuments and she can visit Capitol Hill and she can go to the national museums, including the American Latino Museum. And she can see all of these stories that I've been talking about and she can leave that museum proud, not only to be a Latina, but proud to be an American. Thanks very much for your time. Danny, thank you so much. You know, I, I, I have to say, imagine if the story of the influence and impact of the Latino and Puerto Rican people here in the state of Connecticut and beyond were told in the way that you just told it as expansively as you just portrayed it. I, I happen to be one of those people that believes that when young people see themselves in their history, when young people see themselves in what they are learning and what they are doing, they see the thread of their own uh, influence and the influence of their ancestors, it is life-saving because they are able to see their own possibility and their own future. So to anyone listening for the benefit of our CTN viewers and for our Facebook Live viewers, this is something that I think all young people in the state of Connecticut can rally around to get the full story, the whole story, so that we all see ourselves in the future of this state. So thank you for that, Danny Vargas. And, and next, you know, from, from the national scene to the local scene, uh, a person that really needs no uh, introduction or very little introduction. Steve, you muted yourself. There you go. So that's our commission. She's the current um, uh, subcommission chair. And I'd like to welcome you, Gladys, to say a few words and to really uh, give us a little bit of the flavor for what you've done here in the state of Connecticut and why civic engagement and the uh, power and passion and influence of Latinos and Puerto Ricans is so important here. Well, thank you. Um, I'm so happy to be part of this panel. Um, Throughout the years I've worked with our community in Hartford, I was president of the Puerto Rican Parade for over 30 years, managed that. Um, worked on many organizations and was on the board of La Casa de Puerto Rico, um, the Connecticut Puerto Rican Forum, and a lot of agencies that were critical to our um, well-being. Um, it, it's interesting that I hear everybody talking, especially about um, elections and um, the census, we need to be counted. That's very important. Our community um, seems to not want to step up to the plate and we need to find better ways of getting them involved. Um, one of the things that I hear a lot when I go out and I talk, um, I did census um, door to door knocking for a little bit recently and people don't want to give their numbers. They don't want to give information. They just feel that um, nothing, gets, nothing gets done. They're still in poverty. They're still, like you said, living five families to an apartment. They can't get the services that they need. So, you know, we need to do better when it comes to that. We need to um, either recreate some of these agencies that were around. I mean, I came back from Puerto Rico. I, I retired, moved to Puerto Rico, came back during Maria and um, wound up having working with um, the Hurricane Relief Center to help a lot of these families get back on their 
feet. And it was really hard to get our communities and our agencies to work together to do this. Um, so we have to do a lot better with that. Another thing that I hear a lot is, why am I going to go out and vote? I only see politicians out when it's time to vote. We need to be knocking on doors. We need to be finding out what is important to them on a year-round basis, not just when we need a vote. Um, so finding ways to better our community is very important. And, you know, I'm here to help in whatever I can. Gladys, thank you so much. And, and your leadership with the commissions, not only in its most recent iteration, uh, but also historically, has really been one of the hallmarks of how it is that uh, Latinos have contributed in the state and Puerto Ricans have really made their presence and their influence uh, and, and, their, and their real empathy uh, shine in the state of Connecticut. And also expressing that enlace, those ties to Puerto Rico, to the island, and how it is that our communities are so interwoven together. Uh, so thank you for that, Gladys, and for that. And also, I, I, I would be, uh, I think our, our next guest really tells the fuller story and the whole story about the legacy of leadership. And that's Isaias Diaz. Isaias is an attorney and he's a former chair of the Latino and Puerto Rican Affairs Commission and a community and faith leader. Welcome Isaias, really happy to have you here. Uh, it's an honor to be here and it's uh, good to be doing this type of work again. I miss it dearly. Sorry. So, you... so Isaias, I'd love for you to, you know, give us a little bit of the flavor in the history. Now you said you miss it, you miss the work and I'm sure that you haven't been silent or quiet throughout the years uh, since your leadership at the commission. Tell us a little bit about what you see as the promise of the state, uh, the promise of the Puerto Rican community in the state, and how it is that our viewers who may or may not be Puerto Rican, maybe Latino and others, can really uh, tap into what the future of this state holds for our communities. Well, one of the beautiful things about the state of Connecticut is that uh, we don't have a lot of the hurdles that maybe a lot of other states do. Uh, Puerto Ricans have had a long history of being here in the state, so it's not like we're an, anom an, an anomaly um, or it's something foreign, so to speak, uh, where it might be in some other states. But myself, being one of nine, uh, coming from the city of Waterbury, and I still live in the city of Waterbury, my parents came up here from Benuelas, Puerto Rico, and there was always a strong sense of community. And I, I thought that at one point, perhaps that was changing until I got connected with the commission again, which at the time it was LPRAC. Um, I wish there was still an LPRAC, but you know, we have to get some money up, I guess. Um, but it, it, it gave me a lot of hope because it, it, it made me realize that there are still a lot of people who want the community to be unified. And there are still a lot of people that were very selfless in the work that they did. What, what I found that helped us prosper as, as, a, as a commission at the time was that the majority of the workers on the commission didn't have an agenda and they were, for the most part, financially independent. Not saying that they're all millionaires or multimillionaires or anything like that, but everybody was educated for the most part, making a good living. And um, so economic gain wasn't um, part of the vision, neither was um, a political ambitions. I was generally, I was surrounded by some of the most biggest bleeding heart people that all they wanted to do was so in to help the community prosper. Um, so, and I'm also a data, uh, data junkie. That's why me and Warren are connected so much. So uh, when Dr. Venator Santiago was talking, I'm already writing down questions that I got to, I got to probe on. So maybe I'll get a chance to do that. Thank you, Issa. Yes. And, and, and we'll come back to you so that you can do that, actually, because I do want to encourage some robust conversation among all of you as well. Uh, you know, we turn now to uh, to our uh, leaders uh, on the panel who have been uh, who have had the privilege of being elected by people who believe in them and who have brought them to uh, centers of gravity in their communities. And one of them is Wildalis Bermudez. Uh, Wildalis. Uh, is a passionate advocate for underserved communities and has spent a, a more than a decade working on policy issues to directly assist Hartford's most uh, vulnerable populations. Uh, Wilalis serves at the Hartford Court of Common Council with the Working Families Party and was elected in 2015 in Hartford. Wilalis, I'm a big fan. Uh, you come from an amazing family who has been uh, uh, at the center of gravity of public service in Connecticut for so long. So we're happy to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for putting together this awesome 
conversation and just for the community to be able to listen in and for us to get feedback from the community and civic engagement is so important. We recognize that we're at a very difficult and challenging time that is this pandemic. And we recognize that for many people, they're trying to get more information um, about basic services. And we, I agree with, with what all the other panelists have said so far. Um, and there's a lot of commonality in looking at a place like Hartford as a little microcosm of what's really happening, not just in Connecticut, but in, in terms of the entire nation and looking within our own Latino Latinx population. And so we, we have to, on the government side, on the municipal side, we have to do more to meet people where they're at. You know, when this pandemic hit, not everybody might be necessarily on social media. Um, and so we have to figure out how do we really connect with our population in a very more direct way. Um, and then on, also on, on the, just the regular uh, resident side, people who before maybe didn't know where to connect or were, were at a loss or maybe felt a lot of apathy um, for, for once are now saying, how do I get involved? What can I do? How can I stay connected? Who do I need to contact? Throughout this crazy times that, that we've, we've been experiencing the last several months, you know, we've, we've done a lot of work and reaching out to different platforms and um, having more access to different types of interviews and posting it out there. And we've gotten on city council, not just uh, questions from people in Hartford. I mean, at one point we've, we've gotten questions from people all the way down in Stamford, right. folks who are saying, okay, look, I have this problem. I haven't been, a, I've been unemployed now um, because of the pandemic and how can I connect with the sources that I need to? And also how do I stay connected within my own community? And so we're at this weird crossroads of, yes, there's an immense amount of resources that our community needs, but also at the same time, the community wants to get involved in ways that are now really exacerbated because of the current state that we're in. Thank you, Willalisa. And you know, it strikes me, and, and you really, you really did reference the generosity of leadership that I have seen among Latinos from one part of the state with Latinos in other parts of the state. And that sharing of information between our communities, which is so critical, not only in expressing um, that, that, that true opportunity and promise of the people of the state, but also in showing how we are a united community. And that is a real, it's a model, I think, for the state of Connecticut. So, so often we talk about how Connecticut is provincialized and how its little towns are, are almost uh, little fiefdoms unto themselves. But what our community has shown is that there is a way for us to connect regionally and statewide in ways that not only help each other, but also learn from each other and, and also grow together. So thank you, Willalis, for that, um, uh, for that message. And you know, when I think about what kids must be seeing right now, if they're watching us on Facebook Live or on CTN, and they say, you know, who do I want to be when I grow up? I think of you and I think of Jason Rojas. Jason, uh, you know, full disclosure, Jason is my state rep. He's a five-term Democratic member of the Connecticut House of Representatives serving since 2008. He represents parts of East Hartford and our very own Manchester, uh, composing Connecticut's ninth assembly district. He currently chairs the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. And I'll tell you, that's, there's something very meaningful there in that so many Latinos, those of you included here on this Brady Bunch panel today, but also the ones who are doing the work on the ground, are centers of influence and centers of impact in the state of Connecticut. And they do so quietly, but they do so steadfastly. So with that, I want to welcome Jason and have you talk a little bit about your style of leadership, what you're seeing for the community and what the promise is for the state of Connecticut. Uh, thanks, Steve. Thanks for inviting me to participate in this. And I want to thank all my panelists for participating today, too. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's been an interesting political uh, career for myself. I think I was a just about a first in every situation that I've had in elected office. I was the from what I know, first Latino elected to the Board of Education in East Hartford, first uh, Latino elected to the Town Council in East Hartford, and, and then first Latino elected to the Connecticut General Assembly from the Town of East Hartford in Manchester as well. So it's always been kind of a, a number of firsts, and certainly it's an honor and a privilege and to some degree a burden um, when folks look up to you as that first. Uh, there's a certain amount of responsibility that comes along with that. 
um, and in ensuring that I meet all the expectations that people have for me from all walks of life. And certainly for the Latino community, I know it's a, a pride point. I know it's a pride point in my at my parents' house. <laughs> We're both Puerto Rican, um, so they're incredibly proud of everything I've done. And in particular, in, in two communities um, that are certainly changing and have been changing significantly over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, it'll be interesting to see the census data when it does come out. We know that there was significant demographic changes in East Hartford and Manchester from 1990 to 2000 and 2000 to 2010. And I suspect that we'll be see some pretty significant uh, changes in the demographic makeup of our communities. I do know now that, you know, in our school districts in East Hartford, uh, Manchester Public Schools are 30% Hispanic. East Hartford's are 36% Hispanic. Um, the, the communities themselves are still a white majority community, 64% in Manchester, 53 in East Hartford. Uh, but I think that certainly signals a, a shift in terms of the makeup of the community and, you know, it's campaign time. And I've been out there door knocking and, you know, I tend to see more Puerto Rican flags flying outside of people's homes, right? And these are single family homes. I mean, I, I think it's dispelling a lot of myths about where Latinos live in our area. Um, I'm seeing more and more families of, of all, from all backgrounds for people of color who are buying homes in East Hartford and Manchester. Um, you know, but I remember when I was first elected, my district looked a little bit different because redistricting changed, but it was 90 something percent white uh, district. And I know I remember at the time when I was elected, there were some folks who didn't think I'd be able to pull that off. Um, and I don't know if the exact how factual this is, but I was told I was the first Latino elected outside of an urban core area. Um, and I think that just speaks well about, um, you know, while we certainly face a lot of uh, racial constraints and, and racism does exist out there, I've always believed that my candidacy was very embraced by the people I represent in the ninth district. Um, and I think they expected what they expect of any candidate, right? Are you competent? Are you smart? Are you going to work hard? Um, right? Are you going to be responsive? Um, so the things that they expected of me as a politician, I think they expected of anyone. Um, but I think they really embraced uh, who I am. I um, mean, I've been lucky to enough, of, you know, to, to be appointed chair of the Finance Revenue and Bonding Committee, which, you know, for whatever reason, I don't know that it's a, a, a committee that people expect a person of color to chair, um, which is something that, it, that people have told me. And I know um, when there have been announcements about, you know, previous chairs being appointed, you know, obviously the Finance Revenue and Bonding Committee is a, a major committee, one of the big two money committees at the legislature. Um, there was always really big profiles done on whoever's appointed uh, chair of that committee. Um, and when I was appointed chair of that committee, that wasn't done. Um, perhaps it was just an oversight. Um, I don't know. I actually had a capital reporter apologize to me afterwards that somehow they missed covering uh, my appointment as chair of one of the big uh, two money committees. And, you know, so I think that still reflects some of the challenges that we face in terms of being noticed and being recognized up at the Capitol. Um, you know, I'm, I was thinking about the members of the legislature uh, who are Hispanic. I know we have 10 house members who are Puerto Rican. Uh, we have one house member who is Filipino and considers himself Latino and is a member of the black and Puerto Rican caucus. Um, and we, uh, we have a, in the Senate, uh, we have a Senator who has an Argentinian background and another one who's Dominican. Um, and I think we're seeing, we're beginning to see uh, us representing areas that just aren't traditional urban areas where I think a lot of people like to pigeonhole us and I just, you know, I'll be really fascinated to see the census data that's out there um, to see exactly where we've grown. And we certainly have Latinos all over the place um, throughout Connecticut. Um, but in looking at that map, we, we also know that Connecticut is a incredibly segregated, both racially and economically uh, segregated state. And, and that reflects in the data that you were looking. There are a lot of red dots kind of along the I-84 corridor, obviously out in Willimantic. Uh, we have a healthy growing community out in Torrington and down in New London, but uh, we tend to be uh, segregated into our core urban areas. But as we continue to grow out into our suburban communities, one of the things that I've noticed um, as need increases in communities like East Hartford and Manchester, we don't have that nonprofit capacity or nonprofit community to help serve the needs of the folks who are moving out to places like East Hartford and Manchester. So we know they have a lot of strong connections to their community networks in places like Hartford, uh, for those of us in the Hartford region. Um, and I think that's a good thing. We're seeing a lot of connections and I think there's a lot more that connects us as communities uh, than divides us. And in a place uh, like Connecticut, where our political psychology is really, really focused on the micro level, um, I think we see some opportunities for collaboration between legislators who represent communities who perhaps in the past would have never thought they would, they would have something in common. Thank you, Representative Rojas. You know, I, 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 look, I look across the spectrum of the Latino and Puerto Rican influence in the state. 
I see business leaders, entrepreneurs, I see uh, teachers, I see community leaders, I see helpers, I see lawyers, I see first responders and first providers. You know, our people are across the state and having that type of impact. Secretary Merrill, you know, to come back to you on the question of civics, as you know, the commission is the home of the Parent Leadership Training Institute, and you've been a big supporter of that over the years. Civics is critical and civic engagement is critical and as are the skills of civics, how it is that we know how our democracy works and how we can engage in it. Can you tell us a little bit about your office's efforts in really promoting civics and really expanding the table of civic engagement for the people of the state? If you could just unmute, Secretary. <laughs> yep, thank you. <laughs> yes, it has been a strong interest of mine. I was a teacher when I came into politics as well as a lawyer, uh, but I was a social studies teacher and was very, very interested in the issue of how we are teaching the next generation uh, about our government, about how to participate in our government and our communities. And uh, I think we've made some strides since we first started in on this idea. I, I think uh, civics education has taken a back seat to many other things in our curricula these days. And that's what motivated me at the time. But then it became clear that um, a lot of the structures we used to have for people to participate have frayed a little bit. And I think it's important for us to realize there are new community structures out there, uh, a lot of them very locally based, uh, some of them around uh, churches and other sorts of associations where people do gather. So one of the first things we did when I came into office is I did something called the Civic Health Index. We wanted to see what was actually going on out there in terms of participation by people, because even though not everyone was voting, Clearly, they were doing something out there. And so we uh, got together a group that uh, was intended just to kind of get together the data on what we called the civic health of communities. And we asked questions, all kinds of different questions that you wouldn't ask normally. Uh, things like, you know, are you part of associations? Which associations are there? And social kinds of questions like, how often do you uh, have dinner with your family every week? Uh, where are your social interactions happening? So far beyond just this idea of who's voting, trying to get a handle on what was really, what people were really doing out there to connect with each other. We got some very interesting data, um, a lot of it around issues like, like people feeling invited in. I think the most important outcome of that entire study, which is still online, we did two versions of it, and the people that participated, which came from a variety of organizations among others, I know that uh, the, uh, you were part of that as well as you know uh, the other commissions at the time. Um, the most important message that came through to me with all that was that people participate in things when they are asked in. It seems like a very simple idea, but I think that's in a way something we've been talking about today, uh, which is that we need to be good at asking people into our political and civic culture. And so that, so after we did that study and we came to this very kind of simple but powerful conclusion, uh, we did uh, go out and try to make a difference in terms of uh, inviting people in and sort of um, getting involved in not only schools, but also other associations and doing outreach in a new and different way. So that that's some of the work we started uh, doing. We did after that uh, form some interesting school programs. We have something called the Red, White and Blue Schools where school children are encouraged to participate in community events and make a difference in their own uh, towns. And that, you know, so every year we have a theme uh, and that theme can be anything. Sometimes it was historic. Uh, sometimes it was activism around issues going on in their town. Uh, that's been really successful. And we encourage ch children right down to the elementary level because, you know, that's when children really learn about civic participation. I mean, they can tell you right off the bat when they're maybe three years old, they can tell you what's fair and what isn't fair. And that's where you start. 
So uh, yes, we have made a lot of progress, I think, in terms of our outreach to different communities. And um, I have people in my office that are actively working on not just registering people to vote, but also bringing information to the communities and, um, and establishing relationships with things like the, the, um, the training that we did with parents. That is one of the outgrowths of that study was that program, uh, which, which really uh, trained parents and many of them uh, Latino parents to advocate for their children. Because that's the other thing we found out is that one of the most powerful motivators for lots of people, particularly in the Latino community, is their children, the education of their children. So we worked with a lot of different groups like the Madres Latinas in uh, Waterbury and uh, a lot of other different groups to do the, uh, the parent leadership training program where we literally trained parents to be activists for their children. It's been a remarkable program. I know you know all about it because your office has been a sponsor of that program. Uh, but I think that has gone a long way to empower a new generation of parents to understand the political system and how to access that power, which is what it's about, really. So they advocated, they got, uh, for example, a new middle school in Waterbury, as I recall, many, this is many years going back now, but uh, they've advocated very powerfully for their children in their different communities, and they themselves have become active, civic, engaged people. So uh, that's been, those are the kinds of programs we love to promote. I wish I had more time for it, <laughs> uh, but I keep, I keep trying to do it in spite of the fact that we also have to do things like, you know, administer elections. Um, but those are, and thank you for your partnership on those programs. It's been, it's been really wonderful and I, I hope we can do more in the future. Thank you, Secretary Merrill. And you know, what's, what is remarkable, as you said, is the power that parents have when they realize I'm not just a parent, I'm just a parent is really, I am a parent. And I have, I have, I can learn how budgets are, are, are drafted. I can learn how, how elections work. I can learn where the power centers are and my role in making a difference. And it really does open up possibilities. There's so many leaders in the state that have graduated through some of the programs that you described, including Parent C and PLTI. And it's really exciting to see the fruits of that civic engagement labor. So thank you for all of your work, Madam Secretary. Um, Lin Manuel Miranda, Danny, I, I love to think of Lin Manuel Miranda as a, as a son of Connecticut, or at least we borrowed him for a while. And I, I, I marvel at the fact that what he was able to do by reimagining the founding through taking that narrative and interpreting it through the eyes and the body and the experience of people of color was just so powerful. So, you know, in your work, the establishing a cultural and a central gravity of narrative of the Latino as an asset is so critical. Tell us a little bit about that. Why is it important to tell the story of Latinos and to, in, to weave into the narrative of the United States, the influence of our communities uh, in its history? You know, it's funny, Stephen, that you should mention that because look, we, one of the things we talk about is the fact that uh, Latino history is American history. And the fact that uh, when you look at the history books and you look at the, the times of the revolution, uh, for example, and you see the, the, the white faces and painted and the paintings and so forth, the only reason you see only white faces in those paintings is that you didn't look around. You know, there were brown faces, there were black faces there. Uh, so Lynn manuel when he did uh, Hamilton, I thought that was so innovative and so new, but the reality is that there were already Latinos there fighting on our behalf. I talked about General Bernardo Galvez uh, earlier, the Spanish general. He was also the governor of Cuba and the Louisiana Territory, which comprised about 13 U.S. states right now. Uh, people would think that it was uh, the French, the Louisiana Territory was just, at the time, it was under Spanish rule. So Spain was incredibly instrumental in making sure that General Washington could win that war, not only through troops, but through goods and money and supplies and so forth. So American history is uh, driven in our history books by people who choose to write the story. They haven't told the complete story. Uh, and that's what we're advocating is saying that, look, whether you are a, a recent immigrant to this country or whether your family has been here for 20 generations, you can be proud of the contributions that the Latino community has made to the building and the founding of this nation. I talk a lot about the military contributions just because I'm a veteran, but we've been contributing in every single aspect of American society. This country would not be what it is today. It would look completely different 
were, were it not for those contributions. So when we talk about the Latino narrative, it's a, a narrative that we're describing that includes not only who we are today, but who we have been for 500 years in creating this country. Uh, you know, I talk about the fact that three of the four most populous states in the country have Spanish names. Uh, and that's not by accident. That's not a new revelation. Uh, so we need to be, uh, you know, more assertive and more proud of the contributions that that we have made over time and what we continue to make today. Thank you, Danny. Professor Benito Santiago, there was a there was a statement earlier about how it is that we are a culture as Latinos and Puerto Ricans, and that we bring with us a diversity. That, that really does link us across time and space. And I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that diversity and how it is that that diversity not only informs us as a community and brings us together, but also could be uh, perhaps a, a North Star that we could look toward in the United States and in Connecticut on how it is that we can work across difference, across culture and across divide and really come together. Well, you know, it's interesting that, that you say that because the, the American Latino Museum, I think, promises to, to highlight that in, in, in important ways. Uh, so some of the research that, that's available, for example, in voter participation, uh, uses the term coalition building and solidarity. And one of the things that we're finding is that a lot of Latinos sometimes even identify as conservative, but are affected by the material conditions in their lives. They, they, they regard whether they're citizens or not, they still need employment, they still need decent housing, they still need uh, to participate in the table if you want. And Spanish or Spanglish in some instances has been a vehicle for some of that uh, because somehow language sort of uh, weaves together a, a, a common story, whether it dates back to Spain or whether it dates back to this place or African uh, slaves or, or whether it dates back to other populations. The other thing that I think is really interesting is that Latinos have come together in, in media, they've come together in popular representations, and in some ways, I don't want to say they've erased, but they've come together as Latinos to become a face, a national face. And the best example that I use is Sonia, Chief Justice, oh, not Chief Justice, I wish, uh, Justice Sotio, <laughs> Sonia Sotomayor, who, when she was elected, at one point, she became the most popular Latino in the United States. Uh, because she was a figurehead that embodied somebody who came from El Barrio, well, maybe not El Barrio, but, but family had migrated to New York and, and rose to one of the highest offices in the nation. So I think even though there are, we're a plural society, the idea of, of a shared language, the idea of a shared heritage, the idea of some common ground can not only open doors for political participation, which is what I'm interested in, but also for sort of empowerment in different institutions. Now, I, I applaud the work that Danny Vargas and others are doing uh, because those are the kinds of institution buildings that are gonna create the opportunities for Puerto Ricans or Latinos more generally to feel a part of the United States, to be a part of the United States, even if it's symbolically through a museum, but also institutionally. The more people sit on the table, the more they feel a part of the United States. Thank you, Professor. You know, when I think about, thank you for bringing up uh, uh, Justice uh, Sonia Sotomayor. When you think about the pinnacle of our profession as attorneys and you think about the promise, I think that so many of our young people see in having an example uh, of, of a professional at the highest rankings uh, of influence and of and of really of, of making a difference. We think of Sonia Sotomayor as a Latino and as an attorney. Isa, yes, I know, uh, you know, one of the key things that you worked on throughout your career and have uh, is really seeing our people as assets. Why is it important that young people, especially, but all of us see uh, Latinos and Puerto Ricans in the highest levels of government, the highest levels of our professions in business? Why is it key uh, for, for the continuing success of our state and our people? Well, I, I think uh, when it comes to um, the continued success of our people, it, it, I go back to what Dr. Vendor Santiago was saying about having a seat at the table. Um, and just being transparent, when I had great ideas when I was still a teenager before I had a law degree. Now I have a law degree and all of a sudden people actually want to listen to me. And uh, I wish it didn't have to be that way, but unfortunately that's the world that we live in that's kind of driven by materialism. So I find that if you really want to be able to change people, you have to have access to the network to do so. 
and you have to have access to the connections. And one of the biggest things that I found getting involved with the community is there's always someone who has a skill set that can benefit somebody or a service that they can offer or uh, some form of help. Like I'm not the social service guy, but I know who to send to for the social service stuff. I'm not the, uh, the, the techie, but I know who is the guy in the Latino community who's the techie. As we continue to rise and we continue to rise and different people in our community gain notoriety, we can pull together and create a stronger network to elevate the people. It, it's, it's kind of a rising tide theory, I guess, but um, that's what I've seen work historically. And um, that's the type of people that are on this panel right now. Thank you, Isaias. So many of us on this panel, I'm sure, um, and in our culture are so connected to our grandparents. And as the oldest, as the oldest grandson of my grandmother, you know what you know what that responsibility, what responsibility came with it. And a lot of that responsibility is always reach back, reach back to your siblings, reach back to your cousins, reach back to your community, and be a mentor and benefit from mentorship. And and you know it strikes me that that type of leadership, Wildalis, is a type of leadership that I've seen in you, an independent leadership and a style that also reaches back. So tell us a little bit about the importance of, you know, sometimes bucking the trends in order to be a better leader and a strong leader, because you've certainly done it. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, I mean, you know, we've talked a lot about, obviously, the importance of our history and our culture. And what I, my experience, and again, growing up here in Hartford, but from, I, my parents are both Puerto Ricanos. I came here at a very young age. They, they came, I came here as a, as a little child, as, as a baby. And so one of the things that I've experienced in this setting um, is, and go, attending public schools is that we were not taught our history, right? And so we were not taught our history in school and we did not have that opportunity to make those connections, to, to know the abundance of all of the impacts that that we've had it wasn't until i went to college that where i ended up you know being becoming fascinated with latin american and caribbean history where i learned more about my roots and and thank god for the the base of having the foundation at home from my parents who instilled and encouraged and nurtured but i could only imagine all the other students who who did not have that and I think that when we're looking at, you know, celebrating the what we've done as as Latinos, as Hispanics, and when we look at imparting that knowledge to the, the next generation, the future generation, and um, when we look at fighting for the importance of what's happening on the ground, and all of those things are so interconnected. Um, we really have to be super honest with ourselves and, and stay very true to, to what's really happening. Because in places like Hartford and cities like Hartford, um, you know, the little Wildelises who did not have access to learning about uh, Latino culture still don't, right? And when I, and then when we're talking about civic engagement, when I, in, 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 the, in the last couple of months have done uh, a lot of calls with young people um, who are actively trying to promote the census and which is awesome and are, um, are doing, at that point, we're doing summer programs um, to do things in their community. The, the reality of it was that a lot of them didn't really understand what the civic process was. Like what, what is, how do they connect to this bigger world that is their own community? And so, that we have to do a better job in in connecting all those things so that all of us so that we as a community as a culture could prosper in places like the little hartfords of connecticut and also the little hartfords that exist in the us because there is a there's a disconnect there while on the one hand one of my points was we're at a very critical time and we all recognize this. And we have a lot of, we have an opportunity to access as much information as possible. But on the other hand, it's like, how do young people, how are they able to filter through that information when on their own, when because it's not provided to them um, in school in a regular setting. And so that amongst everything else um, is, 
you know, wanting to connect with so many, so many residents in Hartford, um, wanting to impart for me, wanting to impart more knowledge and saying, hey, this is what's happening right where you live. And by the way, if you don't live in Hartford, here's what's available to you. These are the resources that are available to you during this pandemic. Um, and by the way, it, I'm not gonna, one of the things that, that really has ignited my, that fire, that fire in my belly is because I, I, I see this play out oftentimes when people don't have that information and we need to do better in terms of sharing it and providing it to them. And as well as part of that process, it's kind of going against the regular mainstream way of doing things. In other words, what I'm trying to say is I'm not going to wait for somebody else who um, who maybe is a, at a higher position than I am um, to say, okay, we're going to do this. No, we can't wait. And so, when the an example when the pandemic started, you know, myself and Councilman um, Josh McDum, he has a little uh, school bus that he, that he owns, and he painted it black, and so we drove around the city and trying to um, get folks whatever kind of re food resources, groceries that they needed. Um, when, again, when the pandemic hit, uh, three months into the pandemic and, and we applaud the efforts of the Hartford Public School System for being out there and providing lunches to people, what we did was we printed flyers of important information that the community did, needed to know. Um, basic information like where do I file unemployment? What do I do if my landlord is currently kicking me out? A lot of them didn't know that the executive order had been signed from Governor Lamont that explained like you can't actually get kicked to the curb. So we, we tried to do, it's about meeting people where they're at and it's about not waiting for other people to tell you when to do things because when you see that need in the, in the community, you just do it. You just provide the resources and you bring people together and you, you try to make sure that um, you're there for people when they're most in need. And I, you know, I, I think it's so important to make sure that that we, we speak truthfully because there's still a lot more work to be done. Uh, obviously, there has there have been so many numerous um, accomplishments that that our culture and, and our Latino or Hispanic culture has made. Um, but at the same time, we still especially in the cities, in cities like Hartford that are continue to be underserved populations are still confronting a lot of the cycles of poverty that have existed for so long um, because of the disinvestment that has happened in our cities. With Alice, thank you so much for that. And you've really, you've really given us a landscape, I think, of what the opportunity and the promises, but also the complexity uh, that so many of our people find themselves in. You know, um, Gladys, when I think about um, the center of gravity that you have carried through over the years as a, as a leader and as, a, as, a, as someone who has given back to community as a, as a, as a local leader as well, I, you know, I'm, I, I keep coming back to what you said about what brought you back to Connecticut. And it was emergency and it was wanting to help people. And I, and when I, one of the first things that was really, that we really dug deep in in the state of Connecticut uh, after this, in this pandemic is resiliency. But what was striking about this conversation about resiliency that was led by Lisa Tepper Bates over at the, at the governor's shop was that we stopped talking about the necessary resiliency of our individual people who were being impacted. And we started talking about the resiliency of the state if the state is not prepared to engage with, to communicate with, and to fully enfranchise its people, then the state is not resilient. So tell us a little bit about that, Gladys, and your efforts to helping make the state and its people more resilient in emergency and outside of emergency. Well, I think the biggest, um, the biggest thing is collaboration. You know, I, I have the advantage, I think, with through the Puerto Rican parade, um, that we've worked with a lot of different towns. And we got together and just made sure that we had a great network and within ourselves, we were able to pull people together to help others. Um, I don't know, Jason, if you remember way back then, I, uh, I think weighed 90 pounds and had red hair, but I, st I was on the Economic Development Commission in East Hartford and the Redevelopment Agency and started the first um, 
Hispanic uh, group to get you elected actually into the Board of Education with Jim Kate. And to us, that was a big, you know, a big win. We, I, I mean, I admire you for everything that you've done. And we really need more Jason and with Dalis in our state so that we can bring um, all of this guidance and collaboration to our community. I think that's very, very important. Um, we can turn a blind eye to the fact that we have a lot of poverty in our state and we have to do better. We have to do better. We have to go out, pound the pavement because unfortunately they're not, they don't have the resources to, um, to see a Zoom meeting like this. Um, so, so we do have to find ways and uh, kudos to you, Odalise, for um, the efforts during the pandemic to get out and help others. Thank you so much. And, you know, I think about the work of breaking those intergenerational cycles of poverty that you described with Lalise, you mentioned them as well. And a lot of that is asset building and really uh, shoring up the foundation of what generations are, are, are the, to ensure that they're prepared, but also ensure that they are able to contribute. And Jason, I remember one of the first things that you and I worked on together when I first came here to the state was uh, what they called at the time the Achievement Gap Task Force, but we know now was more of an opportunity gap. Uh, but it was early literacy and the importance of early literacy and ensuring that young people have a leg up uh, and a hand up, not a hand out, and understanding uh, the importance of literacy and the important elements of learning to read. So tell us a little bit about your continuing efforts there and also about some of the other hallmarks of, of success that you think are important for our young people uh, to be engaged and contributing in the state. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, as I look back to that, you reminded me of, you know, our, our goal for ending the achievement gap was actually 2020, right, when we uh, participated in that task force in 2012, I think it was. Um, and it's 2020. Um, and I don't know that we're any closer to uh, closing the achievement gap or addressing the opportunity gap, as some people like to refer to it. Um, and I think it speaks a lot to, you know, how committed you have to be to this work. Um, and how we need to develop more allies, right? It just can't be the Latinos or African-Americans in the legislature um, who are focused on these types of issues that disproportionately impact communities like ours. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it's clear that we have a long way to go despite all the progress that we've made. I think we need to celebrate that progress, but, um, you know, there's clearly a lot more work that needs to be done. And when you think about literacy and reading, it's at the core of all learning that our, our, we expect from our students and being able to accomplish. And we know that our communities are the places that lack access to higher quality early childhood education or where they have parents who are working multiple jobs and can't spend the kind of time that we'd all prefer um, they spend um, with their children, uh, particularly in those formative early years, right? From birth to five, um, before they get into formal education, um, from expanding the opportunities we have to expose children to learning and learning in all ways, right? Not just books, but it's whether it's accessing the Wadsworth uh, Anthony I'm right here in Hartford, right? And how many folks from our community go to the Wadsworth and are the offerings at the Wadsworth actually relevant to us, right? And I participated in a survey group and I say that because that's what I said to them. Um, and same with the Hartford stage, right? I've been to the theater there. Um, what kind of pr programming are they putting on in place that's relevant to us, that's of interest to us? And perhaps that could be of interest to their traditional patrons. Um, and, and I think that was an eye-opening answer for them to hear, uh, particularly as the demographics of our state continue to shift, um, older white population moving on, uh, communities of colors continuing to grow. We are gonna be the future patrons of all those cultural institutions and what are they gonna do to be relevant to us? And I think the, the same goes for education and even in higher education, I work at Trinity College um, in my non-political life um, and we're seeing changes um, we're, we're changing our enrollment policies and reflecting our enrollment policies to reflect the demographics that are the reality of our country. And we know that it's Latino students, it's African-American students, it's international students. And uh, we know that we have to be intentional in terms of reaching out to them because this isn't the kind of place that I think uh, a lot of those uh, populations see as a place for them. At least that was my experience growing up. I knew that Trinity College, right, was a wonderful institution, a great college. And well, Elise um, is a proud, I, I hope is a proud alum. We're proud to have her as an alum. Um, but, you know, it, it's going to take a lot of, we're going to have to be really intentional in all of those things if we really want to move the needle in terms of, of, of improving access and, and moving us all in the right direction. 
Thank you, Jason. Believe it or not, folks, we've come upon the hour. Uh, it's really gone by very, very quickly, but that's what happens when you're among family. And it's what happens when you are having a, a discussion that I think is invigorating, uh, not only for all of us here as Latinos and Puerto Ricans, but also for people in the community. So on behalf uh, of the people of the state who've been watching, I'd really, and on, on behalf of the commission, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for participating today at the beginning of what is uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. You know, the future of Connecticut, uh, to several of your points, the future of Connecticut is multiracial, the future of Connecticut is multi-generational, it is multilingual, and it is dynamic, and I think uh, an example for the rest of the country. And at the core of that is the example of the Latino and Puerto Rican communities that really embody all of those principles and all of that promise. So with all of that, I'd like to thank you all again. And I'd like to invite each and every one of you to come back in one way or another and continue these conversations of impact and import to the people of the state of Connecticut. Thank you so much and have a great evening, everyone.